Welcome to the annual NIAS lecture. The live lecture starts at 4 p.m. and we proudly present the, art the artistic program by Sites of Memory, Richard Kofi and Amsterdam Museum. See you shortly, stay tuned. We are here to listen to the voices of the people that lived in Amsterdam, known as the black community of the 17th century. Baptismal and marriage records and notorial deeds showed they were a tightly linked community. They came from places like Brazil, Cabo Verde, Sao Tome, Ghana, Cape Town. Next to the Botanical Garden in Amsterdam, there is an area of grass. It's unmarked. This is a sacred place where the members of the black community are buried. The soil remembers their names. Sara, Esther, Emmanuel, Luido, Christoph, Christina, and many, many more. Perhaps they are not the names you were born with, and we may never know what your lived experiences were like. But we are here to honor your memory. city under this green green grass this was the place you were seen last time buried your body covered you in the past we are here now to make your memory at long last at long last at long last, at long last. So many bodies, so many bodies buried in time. Too many pirates, too many pirates, too many crimes. We give pain to love, yes, we rise above. So many bodies buried in time, too many pirates, too many crimes. We give pain to love, yes, we rise above. So many bodies buried in so many bodies buried in too many pirates too many too many pirates too many so many bodies so many so many bodies so many too many too many too many too many so many bodies buried in time too many pirates too many crimes we give pain to love yes we rise above you you count time. We celebrate the birth of new stars in the night sky. Way before El Wazine got the third star in her belt. Remembering is reconstructing. The foundations of my family that are baked into the clay of this land and present in this body. 
This body is not a box built to be carried by someone who thinks it is empty. The space in between my heart and my soul is an endless gallery filled with the art of my humanity in harmony with the living. We make ways with our feet at Huricuajo. No more silence. Our voices in our tears. Receiving the not knowing. The transparent is a comfort. Our bodies hold stories that want to be told. We are exactly where need be. Collecting the elements of change. If your glory is connected to violence, do not repeat. Our voices, transparent in our tears, seeking transformation to set us free. We staan hier in de tentoonstelling Refresh Amsterdam, een tentoonstelling over stadscultuur. En je ziet hier 25 hedendaagse makers die reflecteren op de stad van nu en het thema Sense of Place. Een sense of Place gaat over mensen en hoe zij zich voelen in de stad. Kunnen zij zich er thuis voelen? Uh, wat betekent Amsterdam voor hen? Ik ben Imara Limon, curator van Refresh Amsterdam. Aan het begin van het jaar hebben we een open call uitgezet waarbij hedendaagse makers konden reageren op het thema Sense of Place. En zij konden een voorstel indienen en daaruit hebben we er 25 geselecteerd. Ja, de open call was, uh, ja, kom met een goed plan. Kom gewoon met een goed plan over, uh, over, over jouw werk, over jouw stad, over, over de wereld waarin je leeft. Het mag schuren, het mag alle kanten op bewegen. Open blik. Ik ben Raquel van Haver, uh, kunstenaar, schilder. Ik maak collages, ik maak tekeningen. Het idee is eigenlijk om een serie te maken over activisten in Amsterdam. En vooral activisten die op uh, Black Lives Matter zitten, maar ook op het uh, uit Zwarte Piet uh, zitten. Die eigenlijk een, ja, een sound, een geluid willen laten klinken in eigenlijk de Amsterdamse en Nederlandse geschiedenis. Het zijn allemaal een groep mensen, kunstenaars, schrijvers, activisten, die iets hebben veranderd in de afgelopen tien jaar. En deze mensen wil ik heel graag eigenlijk uh, op het doek hebben. Net zoals de regenten portretten wil ik juist deze mensen nu in dezelfde soort settingen neerzetten. En daar worden dus heel veel grote nieuwe werken van gemaakt. En dit is de eerste, dit is niet het hele groepje, maar een aantal mensen. En vanuit daar kan ik het netwerk opbouwen en iedereen een schilderij geven. Ik ben Tirzo Marta en ik ben beeldende kunstenaar van beroep. Het werk waar wij nu voor staan is getiteld uh, To Wish I Was There. Het is een werk gebaseerd op uh, ja, de huidige situatie waarin wij zitten met het coronavirus. Waarbij mensen onder andere omstandigheden moeten functioneren. Omdat je ruimte om te bewegen die is er niet zozeer aanwezig zoals het voorheen was. Maar het is veel meer vanuit een digitale beleving. Je zit aan de ene kant van de tafel op een stoel mama of papa te wezen en op de stoel daar tegenover ben je curator of directeur. En nu plotseling zit je aan tafel en, uh, en je dochter of je zoon die zegt mama ik moet eten, weet je, midden in een vergadering. Dus, dus dat was voor mij heel erg te gek en bijzonder, want het laat je een soort van 
uh, uh, meerdere lagen zien van uh, het bestaan van de mensen. Ik heb 14 potloodtekeningen gemaakt uh, en daarin vertel ik eigenlijk het verhaal van mijn familie en hoe zij van China naar Nederland zijn gekomen. Ik ben Jaling en uh, ik ben beeldend kunstenaar en illustrator. In het werk begint het verhaal bij het Chinese restaurant en het eindigt ook weer in het uh, restaurant. Omdat men, mijn familie altijd al restaurants heeft uitgebaat, dus dat begon met mijn overgrootopa. Daarna mijn opa en daarna mijn ouders. En ik ben zelf ook opgegroeid in het restaurant. Ik heb de tekeningen uh, tot stand gebracht door vragen te stellen aan mijn familie. Dus vooral aan ooms en tantes en mijn opa. Dat is de laatste grootouder die ik nog heb die nog leeft. Over dit verhaal werd thuis eigenlijk nooit gesproken. Ik wist eigenlijk niks van mijn ouders voor hun leven in Nederland. En je hoort hier en daar wel flarden, maar nooit echt het hele verhaal als geheel. Dus ik heb dit project genomen om daar dan om dat in één geheel vast te kunnen leggen. Waar we naar kijken is eigenlijk Amsterdam door de blik van kunstenaars. En daarin worden nieuwe werelden opengelegd. Daarin worden nieuwe dingen ontdekt. Daarin worden nieuwe visies aangereikt. En daarin worden we ook gestimuleerd of ja, ge, ja, ge, geïnspireerd om anders naar onze stad te kijken. Als je kijkt naar musea en de collecties, het erfgoed van de stad, is dat vaak nog een te eenzijdig perspectief. Je ziet en herinnert de verhalen van mensen die de macht en het geld hadden om zichzelf en hun denkbeelden ook te vereeuwigen. En al het andere, dat is eigenlijk nog niet zichtbaar en dat vinden we toch ook belangrijk om te laten zien. Ik hoop dat de mensen die echt best wel wat voor Amsterdam hebben gedaan en ook voor de jongeren van nu, uh, dat die een goede plek krijgen, ook erkenning krijgen en uh, dat men ook... Uh, yeah een soort van inspiratie misschien uit kan halen over die verhalen van deze mensen. Ik hoop dat dat uh, uiteindelijk eruit kan komen. Ik hoop met dit project eigenlijk dat mensen ook herkenning kunnen vinden. Want het is een heel persoonlijk verhaal. Maar ik denk dat er heel veel universele thema's in te vinden zijn. Zoals je ergens thuis willen voelen, het zorgen voor je kinderen of een bestaan willen opbouwen. Hoe verschillend we eigenlijk ook zijn, dat je toch wel... Uh, ja, universele gelijkenis kan vinden in verhalen. Ik kan eigenlijk niet overschatten hoe belangrijk het is om kunstenaars naar de stad te laten kijken. Omdat kunstenaars, ja, dat zijn eigenlijk de thermometers van de samenleving. De ontwikkelingen die plaatsvinden, de grote ontwikkelingen, de confrontaties in de samenleving. Zij vertalen dat naar een heel menselijk niveau, zodat ook wij weer uh, ja, als kijker gaan meedenken met die verandering. It started with a conversation between me and my barber. His name is Ems, my name is Richard Kofi, and the location for this conversation was the Eagle Hair Design Barbershop in the Hommelsestraat in my hometown Arnhem. My barber asked me, um, well, he stated that he found it strange that although, uh, no, he found it strange that when he walked the streets of our city, he would run into street names uh, representing uh, uh, colonists and people who own slaves and that while he wanted to if he wanted to relate to his own heroes his own heritage he had to depend on certain museums to do temporary exhibitions specifically on something from his identity so what we decided to do was to create a collaborative art project consisting of photography drawings a performance and a film to kind of change the barbershop into a cultural place, into a site of political power, of social action, and of artistic exchange. So you're gonna see the video that was part of this collaborative art piece that we made in cooperation with contemporary art platform Der de Wal. Have fun. And can you understand the struggle if you never lived on edge along the boundaries? I mean, we see the cracks, but then we're bound to see. Cause we've been living here for minutes now. But the streets are full of light, but the block is always darker than the night. It calls out murder to the moon, cause no one's listening. Listen in. These whispers are as loud as black boys throwing pounds against the wall. Full pockets Ooh. jingling and laughter cutting through to tangle the sound of sirens that offer anthems to their movements. Straight to the 
jail from school. But, but the stories are a madness though. Remember playing red letter on hot summer's days, darting in and out of blocks to get back to home base. Do you remember water fights and football in the cage? Remember that one time man them said that K had grenades? Yeah, I wouldn't put it past the brother, you know. <laughs> you know them yard men are brave. Remember slot around the back and waiting time for a fade, sitting in the barber shop with no idea what they were saying, just nodding my head and praying they weren't talking to me. Watching football on the TV screen. If Arsenal was on, then Sybil would scream and we'd be in there for hours just chilling and ting. Watching the clients come back and forth to pick up handfuls of green that we'd retreat back to the block with and lean against ochre red walls we'd scarred our names on with markers from school. The smoke rising from our noses as the sun dipped through the avenues of our state to make long shadows of our bodies. Skip one, skip two. At night, us man would chill inside my block till mums came out to drag me in. You man spilling into the night with farewell laughter and bloodshot eyes. I'd close mine and listen hard for the sounds of the night. Hard enough that I could hear the flick of a lighter as it sparked up a spliff across the road in a park where I used to sit on after school dates and spit game till the kiss, yeah. I reminisce. I reminisce.
Welcome to the annual NEOS Lecture 2021. Thank you for joining us online as we go live from Pakhuis de Zwijger in Amsterdam. Um, we hope you enjoyed the, the, the wonderful uh, artistic contributions by Sites of Memory, the Amsterdam Museum and Richard Coffey. Um, my name is Fenneke Becker. I'm head of academic affairs and I will be moderating today's talk. Welkom voor de Nederlanders. Het programma van vandaag is in het Engels. Um, maar als je vragen hebt of als er onduidelijkheden zijn of als er woorden zijn die je niet thuis kan brengen. Schaam je niet en vraag in het Engels of in het Nederlands. Een, uh, je, je stel je vraag in de Q&A en dan zullen wij je zo snel mogelijk beantwoorden. So for everyone counts. Please don't be shy and um, there are no silly questions. And please put your questions in the Q&A and they will be answered. And you can use the hashtag NIAS lecture to engage with us uh, on social media. And we're also curious to know what you hope to learn from today's talk. And the Mentimeter has already started. And please um, let us know how you're doing, what you think and what you're feeling via the Mentimeter. And we will visit the results during the discussion um, at the end of this program. So before we start the NIAS lecture, let me briefly introduce the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. Um, NIAS is an international institute where every year a group of about 50 scholars, artists, journalists and writers come together to work on their own independent research project in a collaborative environment. And the fellows, as we call them, work on their own projects and really help each other in going beyond, moving beyond their disciplinary boundaries uh, in order to be innovative in their own field. And this interdisciplinary, collective and collaborative learning is key to what NIAS stands for. And that is also why we are here today with the annual NIAS lecture, but we also organize monthly NIAS talks. Um, and it, during those talks, the work of our fellow, fellows is presented for a broader audience to make their work accessible. The aim of the annual NIAS lecture is to offer new perspectives and reflections in ongoing public debates. Um, and this year's lecture is the last in a trilogy on history and politics. In this series, in this trilogy, NIAS has invited uh, prominent speakers to share their thoughts and knowledge on the issue of how history and historical events shape or influence social dynamics in the present and even into the future. Today's talk entitled An Imagined Past, The Politics of History Making, specifically focuses on how historical narratives, how stories that we tell ourselves and that we learn from our history books are used and perhaps misused to include and exclude certain groups from belonging to the nation state. And by discussing issues like these, Nias wants to contribute towards a meaningful and constructive discussion in our society today. Today we have three wonderful speakers and we are very proud to present them. Um, the first speaker of today will be Jennifer Tosh. She's a cultural historian and she's the founder of the Black Heritage Tours in Amsterdam and New York and she's a co-founder of the Sides of Memory Foundation. She co-authored books on black heritage in Amsterdam and the Netherlands, uh, which are mentioned in the program book that you have received digitally. And her talk today will be on inclusive public sites of memory and build heritage. Um, Tosh will discuss the importance of incorporating historical narratives of citizens with a migrant background for a common understanding of the past. We're really glad to have Jennifer with us today. Our second speaker is Christophe Bertossi. He, is, he will be joining us live from France. Uh, Christophe Bertossi is political scientist and he's a director of the French Institute of International Relations, IFRI, and uh, this, this Center for Migration and Citizenship. 
His research focuses on nativism, belonging, migration and citizenship, and European immigration pol policies. In 2020, uh, Christopher Bertussi was the guest of the director at NIAS, and uh, he was then exploring how Islam, citizenship, and multiculturalism connect together. Um, in his earlier publications, he shed light uh, uh, on anti-discrimination and the politics of citizenship, and he edited, together with uh, the director of NIAS, Jan Willem Duivendak, and Nancy Foner, a special issue in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. And his talk today will shed light on those uses of history. How do narratives about the past contribute to exclusion or inclusion of certain groups in societies today? Finally, and not the least, we will have the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema, being talking uh, with us. Um, she has a background in sociology and criminology, and uh, she was the party leader of the left-wing party GroenLinks from 2006 to 2011. And since 2018, uh, Femke Halsema is the mayor of Amsterdam. She has written several books, and one of them is the book Macht en Verbeelding, Power and Imagination, which is very closely related to the topic of her talk today. Femke Halsema will reflect on ways uh, in, which how, in which history can be used as a public good, shedding light uh, on attempts to give space to an inclusive way of remembering and commemorating Amsterdam's historical events. Um, but first, before we move to our wonderful speakers, I will give the floor to the director of NIAS and professor at the University of Amsterdam, Jan Willem Duivendak. Allow me to start with a personal professional experience from the past year. As some of you might know, it was recently discovered that the municipality of Amsterdam had a special committee until the early 1960s that tried to prevent homosexuals and lesbians working at the municipality. Since this was known, the question was raised whether this happened elsewhere in the Netherlands as well. I was involved in this research carried out by the Verwey Jonker Institute. The results, soon to be published, show that not many cities have had such special committees. The reason was not that gays and lesbians were welcome at those municipalities, but the exact opposite. It was so unimaginable that gays and lesbians would work for the government and apply for a job. Their existence was so unspeakable, onbestaanbaar in Dutch, that in most cities separate committees were not even considered. Amongst the researchers, we discussed what conclusions to draw, if any, in terms of public acknowledgement of these terrible wrongdoings. And should we recommend a public apology or even ask for compensation? Not many of us researchers were in favor of anything like that. And while preparing my notes for today, I started wondering why not? And what does it tell about the past? or present that an apology for centuries of anti-gay discrimination did, did not seem to make much sense or hold value in our eyes. My provisional answer would be that it actually tells us more about the present than the past. The situation for many LGBTQ people in the Netherlands has dramatically improved and is almost incomparable to the past. The present feels as a break with that past, not as a continuation. Well, let me nuance this. For me, as a gay, gay white, middle-class man, I am in the luxury position not to be marginalized today. For me, it's now almost unimaginable that people like me were unspeakable of half a century ago. First conclusion, in this case, progress exists. We might say that it is common in the Netherlands to embrace sexual and gender equality, at least at the discursive level, and to feel a sense of disbelief about the wrongdoings of the past. Some politicians even rewrite the past as if the Dutch have always been gender and sexual progressive. But there is still a world to win. 
Although the situation has improved, this society is still deeply heteronormative. And there is, a, there is discrimination and violence against gays and lesbians every day. Not to speak about our situation almost everywhere around the world. Second conclusion, perhaps the CUC, who advocates LGBTQ rights in the Netherlands, should ask for apologies after all. How do systems of exclusion of the past play out in societies today? This is one of the topics we aim to explore during this annual NIAS lecture. As much as there is a connection between the homophobia of the past in the Netherlands and anti-gay violence today, there is also an undeniable link between the extreme racial sufferings inflicted during colonialism and slavery and the systemic discrimination of today. It's not just that there is continuity in racism and white supremacism regarding Afro-Dutch people, be it in more covered forms than during the colonial era. We also see that in present day conversations, this colonial past is mobilized in a way that, is actually, that it actually strengthens everyday racism. The past has become the battlefield of the present. In particularly the radical right, permanently in a nostalgic mood, particularly the radical right, wants to be proud of the Dutch colonial past. Their emphasis on the glory of the Dutch past seems related to how these radical right groups define themselves in the here and now. As natives of the country, their dominant position seems justified because of their historical belonging. Their past needs to be glorious in order for their position to sustain in the present. Their claim is thus not so much about the past, it is about the present. It basically tells Afro-Dutch citizens that their side of history is by no means as important as the imagined heroic past of the white Dutch. It tells these citizens they do not truly belong in the Netherlands. Moreover, let's be clear about this, it's not just the radical right. Over the entire political spectrum, nativist ideas are still deeply ingrained in the minds of the Dutch. The shadow of colonialism carries far. Data show that 50% of the Dutch are still proud of their former empire, a figure far higher than that of the British or the French. What does research teach us about countering these exclusionary workings of the past? Overcoming systemic discrimination asks for double change, to do justice to the past and to the present. It's important to add new perspectives to the past, to deepen our knowledge about our history of colonization and slavery, to do justice to the facts. I remain a scholar after all. But doing justice to the past also implies that we look for a shared evaluation of our collective past. As long as one part of Dutch society claims to be proud on a history that made others suffer for its glory, the past will never come to a close. Moreover, it's not just about doing justice to the past for its own sake. It's necessary to look into our stories about the past because they tell us more about the present than the past. They affect people and the dynamics between them in the present fundamentally. These stories impact all of us. While some may claim that their historical heroes of the colonial past should be honored again, others strongly feel it's about time to tear down those statues of Dutch slave traders from their pedestal. People on both sides can be shocked and sometimes outraged by the unwillingness of the others to acknowledge their version of the past. Coming to a shared understanding is therefore easier said than done. Who is willing to let go of their vision of the past, especially when so much glory, or the opposite, suffering has been involved? So once again, and that's the third lesson, 
we have to deal with today's inequalities and perceived threats to our historical identifications if we want to move past this binary discourse. Today's three speakers will discuss these forms of doing justice to the past and the present, or more precisely, how stories about the past affect us living together in the present. Jennifer Tosh will shed a new light on the past and emphasize the necessity of a common understanding of that past. Christophe Bertuzzi will show how narratives about the past, even the, most, even the ones with the best intentions, can contribute to forms of exclusion in the present. While our mayor, Femke Halsema, will reflect on ways in which dealing with the past may help to overcome the schisms of today. Our next speaker is Jennifer Tosh. Welcome, everyone. I want to tell you a story. In 2012, I was an international exchange student here in the Netherlands. And during a course called Dutch Culture and History, which was a prerequisite for the program, I was listening to the instructor talk extensively about the Netherlands as a tolerant country that became a global leader in trade and science and art having become one of the foremost maritime and economic power during the 17th century, known as the Dutch Golden Age. The Dutch had founded the first global commodities exchange in 1611, and the United Dutch East India Company, founded in 1602, was the first multinational company traded on the global exchange. All of these landmarks helped position the Netherlands into becoming one of the 10 richest countries in the world at that time. Wow, I thought, these milestones were indeed much to be celebrated. Yet I couldn't help but wonder, as I was sitting there I, positioning myself as a child of Surinamese parents and ancestors and a direct descendant of this, this particular colonial ancestral history, unlike many of my, my fellow classmates. And, and I asked, how was it that there was very little or if any mention of the Netherlands' colonial aspirations in expanding its empire across the Americas, like Suriname and Brazil and the Caribbean and North America, and of course, Indonesia. How is it possible, I thought, to speak about the greatness of the so-called golden age and all the wealth that it produced for the Netherlands without also mentioning the wars on indigenous people around the world? the invasion and occupation of their lands, or without mentioning slavery, or only as something that happened far away, or talking about the forced labor of the enslaved that cultivated these products that the Dutch society and Europe as a, as a whole consumed and were sold in the exchanges, or about the early black presence in history that was, I thought, rendered non-existent. I was told there was none not until independence of Suriname. These, and these questions and many others formed the basis of my research and further inquiry that led me to develop the Black Heritage Tours in Amsterdam in 2013. It has served me as a platform to explore this earliest black presence in the built heritage, canal houses, national monuments, and museums. I want you to know that my intention really was to shift the gaze to centralize our hidden histories and herstories, to make them more visible, at the same time while deconstructing the notion of the Dutch dominant narrative. It would be later in my studies at the University of Amsterdam, I was inspired by the ideas presented by Pierre Nora, his concept of la lune de mémoire, places of memory, that reflects really the, the nation state's default in terms of its, its commemoration and remembrance. It focuses on this dominant narrative, primarily in the built heritage from a French context, but at the same time, I was trying to apply that to the Netherlands. And again, more questions, whose memories are centered, whose are considered relevant to be included in this dominant narrative, and whose memories are not. 
so the images you see now show on one hand a representation of, of this idea of the national identity, collective memories, the replica of the Dutch East India ship outside the Schreepvaart Museum, the Dutch royal family's golden carriage, the tin pan on the palace of the Dam, Black Pete, World War II, and of course on the other hand, other more stereotypical Dutch cultural elements like tulips and clogs and windmills. But I want to explore with you for a moment, what is this Dutch dominant narrative? What do we really mean by it? I want you to think of it as a way of being, a way of thinking and operating in the world. I'll give you some examples in my experience. Uh, some about the attitudes towards race. One of the things I heard repeatedly was we are colorblind, we being the Dutch society. We don't see race including that we don't see racism embedded in the symbolism of, for example, Black Pete, that's framed as innocent, a party for children, so therefore it can't be racist. As a nation, we, we are self-congratulatory about the, being tolerant and liberal, celebrating the first of many things, like the first to legalize gay marriage, or marijuana in the Netherlands is allowed for personal and recreational consumption. It's tolerated. So that means it's been decriminalized and legal in, to buy in coffee shops. But what many people don't know is that marijuana is actually illegal in the Netherlands. About our collective memory, it focuses on the Dutch East Indies, the Dutch East India Company. It was referred to in text as the jewel of the crown. Our national identity is centered around the glory of this golden era. Our maritime history is unparalleled. The Jewish Holocaust in World War II is remembered as a sacred history, therefore untouchable. And all of our national traditions are unquestionable. Regarding Dutch colonialism, I was told in general, yes, the Dutch were involved in slavery, but only we had 5% of the trade compared to other countries like Great Britain and Spain and Portugal had much, much more. In terms of religion, society was built on Christianity, but today we are predominantly secular, but with a high moral superiority. Dutch exceptionalism, we're not like the British or the Americans. Or another one I heard often is racism is really an American problem that's been imported into our society. And then when I asked about this black presence, this early history that I was mostly interested at after attending a summer school that really, that really foregrounded this, I was met with historical distance. Comments like there was hardly any black presence in the Netherlands. Slavery was not allowed. It was illegal on Dutch soil. Everything happened in the colonies. But as we now know, much more recent years of research has revealed that slavery was indeed tolerated and socially accepted and visibly present in Dutch society. Now I want to move to problematizing this narrative. A problem with the Dutch dominant narrative is it's unreliable as a source for historical reflection. It reveals a, a, a strong paradox on one side steeped in a nostalgia and romanticism, then at the same time concealing a much deeper truth, the other side of this colonial story. Many people long to return to this sense of belonging, to this imagined past, once referred to as the VOC mentality. But why should we be critical of this perspective? What's really been its impact on society? I present to you this quote. Gloria Vecker, who wrote in her book, The Cultural Archives, asked a very important central question. How is it possible for a nation that has been a formidable imperial power for over close to 400 years to imagine that this history will not have left traces in culture, language, knowledge production, and its conception of self and the other. I want you to think of this cultural archives as a place, a repository of memories where they're stored. One of my favorite writers, Chimamanda Adichie, the Nigerian writer said, the danger of the single story isn't that the single story is always wrong, it's just incomplete. And ultimately it dispossesses a whole group of people and most important to think about is that over time, what can happen if it's uncontested? That one story becomes the only story. Now, in this next uh, slide, I want you to really look at these images. 
These are examples of what this cultural archive and how it's still visible in our built heritage, in our city. It's still alive in the art and, again, houses and gable stones, statues, monuments, street names, national buildings. Part of the tour that I do is to really peel back the layers of these symbols and, and add meaning. Again, I want to quote uh, Professor Wecker, Dutch culture developed in many ways as a colonial culture, and the traces are still very present in contemporary society. This is our unfinished business, to release the past from this stronghold. And I, I have to say that over the past several years since I've been here, I've seen a move towards a more multi-directional memory, as Michael Rothberg proposed, as an alternative. Because one of the questions I'm often asked is, well, you're replacing one dominant narrative for another, and that's not the intention. Because without demonizing one history or victimizing the other, without competing memories, we can build on how these various historical narratives and this municipality of ideas can and should coexist. So there's hope, the new paradigm, I call it, the infinite possibilities. James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So what does this new paradigm look like? How do we conceptualize a future gaze? If we do what we say we're going to do, how does that change or will that change our worldview, our attitudes? Well, I think that the idea of implicated subjects which is moving beyond this historical categories of perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. Again, Rothberg offers a new theory of political responsibility. To the figure of the implicated subject, it builds on this previous comparative transnational multidirectional memory framework to speak about interconnections and show how confronting our own implication in difficult histories can lead to new forms of national identity and international solidarity, like what we saw in the solidarity protests around the murder of George Floyd. It's important to view this through an intersectional lens, race, gender, and sexuality, or again, we risk the danger of repeating ourselves, or worse, creating new forms of historical violence and forgetting. By shifting the gaze, again, this new way of looking at our built heritage, at our memories of our history, listening to and acknowledging that these new narratives, these different perspectives or ways of producing knowledge, we've seen just already infiltrating spaces, redefining national identity, and what does it mean when we talk about our collective memories? So what is the future gaze? I mean, this next uh, set of slides is kaleidoscope of images. This is what gives me hope. It displays examples of this new paradigm already in progress. Institutions like the Black Archives, new exhibitions like Black and Rembrandt's Time, Anton de Colm has been added to the Dutch canon. Astrid Romer, the award that she recently received, an, a national award for her writing. The Decolonizing the Museum Projects, Silvana Simons, elected to parliament, starting the first to start her own political party by AIN. Wow, Black Lives Matter in the Netherlands, connected around the world. New narratives, knowledge production, sites of memory, mapping slavery, and of course the Black Heritage Tours. This is just a short list, and examples of new ways of producing knowledge, engaging with history, that's already happening now. It's moving beyond tolerating one another to acceptance and embracing our values and dif differences. Instead of reproducing the dominant narrative, we're creating new narratives. We embrace traditions of oral history, new ways of storytelling, using performance, ongoing activism, national and global solidarity, where diversity and inclusion also means justice and equity from non-racist to actively anti-racist, from progressive control to shared power, where the politics of history making becomes a new form of history democracy. There are infinite possibilities, and I believe we're only limited by our imagination and the fear that we often have of losing 
some of these outdated definitions of who we are. I want to close with a poem that I hope that you will see as a call to action. How does one tell impossible stories? Stories about women, children, and men bearing the names that deface and disfigure, about the words exchanged between captives, freedom seekers, self-emancipated, warriors, and their descendants. Words that were never recorded in the archives, the appeals and prayers and secrets that were never uttered because no one was there to receive them. In the few minutes I had with you today, my intention was both to tell just a few of these impossible stories and to amplify the impossibility of their telling, to make our hidden histories more visible. My intention wasn't anything as miraculous as trying to recover the lives of the enslaved or redeeming the dead, but yet to honor them. It was not intended to produce any new forms of violence or inequality in our historical reflections, but rather to paint a fuller picture of society held captive for so long by history. So what do we do in the meantime? We must continue to interrogate the production of knowledge, eradicate the old outdated dominant narratives, listen to the myriad of voices from different perspectives, the multiverse of ideas, make hidden history visible, confront injustice, stand in solidarity, be co-creators of a future, work together to establish we, who we are today while recruiting, recovering, retrieving, reconciling the past for the sake of our shared future. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer Tosh. Our next speaker is Christophe Bertussi, live from France. Thank you very much, Fennec. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start with a picture. If we can have the first slide. I, I took this picture two years ago near my place in Paris. And when I look at it, I think it's very difficult not to wonder what these people think, what made them sit like this, turning their backs on each other. They do not belong together. It seems an invisible boundary sets them apart. The three persons on the right and this veiled lady on the left. Of course, it's impossible to know what they think or even whether they think something at all, but still, willingly or not, their bodies are telling a story. There is also something else in this picture. Uh, these four people are about the same age, old enough to think not only about the present, but also about the past. And I mean about their lived personal pasts, as well as the wider collective past of a society, including the history of immigration, the history of colonization and decolonization. So, what we see in this picture is not only a story of a boundary setting people apart, it's also a story about how the past is present in the present. The past is present in this peculiar way these four decided to sit on thy bench. It weighs in this picture, but how? And this is what I would like to address in my, in my talk. I believe my perspective can be uh, can complement what Jennifer has just said. My claim is that, of course, we need to unveil and restore aspects of the past that have been hidden behind the walls of the selective forgetting of the past. But we also need to acknowledge that the past is omnipresent in today's reasonings about inclusion and exclusion, about citizenship and immigration. So of course, the importance of history is that it gives a voice to memories that were silenced over the years, over the centuries, but it's not only about what the actual past was. It's not only about how we understand the past. It's also about how we understand the present. And our understanding of the present can be very messy, particularly when it has to do with topics of immigration and Islam. 
which are among the most sensitive issues for many people in many European and other Western societies. We are told so many different narratives about immigration and multiculturalism that it's very difficult to grasp the actual meaning of each of these narratives. And I try to give a sense of that messy feeling with that uh, collage of images, which as a whole is very difficult to decipher, but that still remains extremely impactful despite, or even more probably precisely because they are difficult to decipher. The present is so difficult to, to decipher because of the existence of many different layers. History is one dimension of how we perceive these layers. Amidst these layers, our perceptions of the past can include, but they also can exclude persons or group of persons. So history is important because it plays a central role today in excluding certain groups on the basis of how we see them fit or not to belong to our common history. This emphasizes the extent to which using the past today is driven by considerations from the present time. And this has important uh, moral and political consequences in terms of equality, in terms of inclusion and exclusion. So in order to describe these uses and misuses of the past in contemporary debates about immigration and multiculturalism, Jan Willem Dijvendak and I have coined the notion of historical repertoires in a publication we edited and published last year. In this publication, we define historical repertoires as the elementary grammar about how the past is framed in the present discussions. A grammar about how history is used to evaluate and justify the present. A grammar through which past and present are interwoven. I will show you later some of these historical repertoires that play in different countries. We studied with our co-authors in the publication, but before I turn to examples, I would like to explain more precisely what I mean when I say that past and present are woven together in the present. I already said that the past is used to draw cultural and moral boundaries between us and them. More often than not, public discussions about immigration tend to make a distinction between earlier immigration and today's immigration. This distinction is sustained by comparisons between so-called good immigrants, like Italian Americans of earlier times in the US, for example, and today bad, understand black or Muslim, maybe, immigrants and their offsprings. Preparing this lecture, I learned, for example, that Dean Martin's real name was Dino Crocetti. And I didn't know that, but discovering that Dean Martins is Dino Crocetti doesn't change much of Dean Martin's position in the US culture. It can be celebrated still, even by persons who don't necessarily think that immigrants make a positive contribution to a country today. He and Sinatra and others are seen as Americans to be proud of. But immigration today is not always described as something to be proud of to say the least. So it's a matter of nostalgia, a matter of retro retrospective and prospective thinking, or to be more precise, a matter of what people think immigrants looked like in the past and the negative attitude towards more recent immigration. However, and this is very important, these judgments about better slash yesterday versus worse slash today immigrants go far beyond the content of a given narrative about past immigration. It's not only a matter of positive stories versus negative stories, but a matter of how we frame the relationship between the past and the present, what the US sociologist Nancy Foner calls then and now. Foner shows that comparisons between then and now run the risk of anachronism. For example, when we compare the position held by racial groups today and those in the early 20th century in the US, the very category of white people is 
a historical construct, and in the early 20th century, it was far from clear whether Southern and Eastern European immigrants could be recognized as whites at all. I show here an example I found on an Italian website. Uh, this is an image that was used as illustration of an article entitled, When We Sicilians Were the Negroes. Quando i negri eravamo noi siciliani. The print you see on the top of the slide shows how Italian immigrants were much disliked in the US in the late 19th century. So earlier immigrants were not seen as white as we see them today. Another problem with the comparison between now and then is that comparing now and then also overemphasizes the illusion of novelty, the illusion of change and rupture. For example, in France, when the so-called new immigrants that is coming from predominantly Muslim countries started to be compared in the public discourses of the mid 1980s with previous immigrant populations who had come from Poland and Italy, the issue of immigrant integration started to be framed through this historical comparison as an issue of Islam that is, has a problem of cultural and moral difference. As a matter of fact, the integration of previous European migrants was a very conflictual process too. Italian and Polish immigrants in early 20th century France were challenged as not secular enough. Another example, which you see on the uh, upper part of the slide, uh, is how Emile Zola, one of the most important names in French literature, was invited to go back home, that is to Italy, uh, because of his defense of Cap Captain Dreyfus during the Dreyfus Affair. What you see here is a caricature that was published in 1898 by the anti-Dreyfus newspaper Le Pillory, and the legend uh, reads, since Zola is jeered in France, why wouldn't he go back to his cherished homeland? This is an early instance of nativism that can be compared to today's nativism in Europe, which focuses on Muslims and which is illustrated by this uh, image you can see on the lower part of the slide. There are many inst instances today where Muslims are asked to live because they don't belong. But the example of Zola helps us understand that their being Muslim does not explain why Muslims today are framed along nativist discourses. The example also shows us that when we forget how conflictual past immigrant integration was, the result is another emphasis on what appears as a specificity of the conflicts of today, conflicts which are explained in terms of cultural and moral distance. This points to a relationship between uses of the past and the culturalization of citizenship, that is, this transformation of principles of citizenship, like equality, inclusiveness, into national thick values. And of course, the thicker the values, the more exclusive they are to so-called so, uh, so newcomers. This explains a lot about today's politics of belonging in terms of the so-called multicultural tragedy in a country like the Netherlands or in terms of secularism, laicite, in France. So my point is that the matter is not only about what narratives are used about the past, but also, and maybe more importantly, about how the past-present relationship itself is framed. That is a sort of meta-narrative, what we call historical repertoires in the publication with Jan Willem Duyvendak, meta-narratives that account for how the past is woven into the present. In our work, we identified three relationships between past and present, and I will be very quick uh, with this, but they give you examples about how uh, past and present are related. The first, and we need to move to the next slide, the first relationship is what we call perpetual grace. Please click. The second is what we called accomplished progress. Click again. And the third, with the third click, is what we call rebirth now or never. 
So to be quick, perpetual grace is a frame uh, according to which we as a group have an innate grace compared to others. We have always been like this. Next slide. Yes, that's the one. Uh, this is who we are. One example is how the Netherlands in general and Amsterdam in particular have been described as a place of tolerance ever since the time of Spinoza. The Dutch innate grace with, uh, with this example is that they have always been tolerant ever since the 17th century. Another example is how France, for example, is, is described as the Pays des Lumières, the country of enlightenment based on the specific universalistic conception of the nation. But perpetual grace is not necessarily about inclusion and tolerance. In Germany, it took the form of a German exception related to immigration with the notion that Germany is not a country of immigration, even if it had already become the main immigration country in Europe. Next slide. The second way to frame the relationship between past and present is what we call accomplished progress. It's different from the first uh, frame in the sense that it emphasizes struggles instead of a trans-historical harmony, but still it highlights the ways these struggles have always been overcome. This is an important dimension, for example, of the construction of the British national history in tension with the post-colonial melancholia on the one hand and a structure of racial inequality in the British society that has to do with the colonial legacy on the other hand. So one way to overcome this tension was the invention of the anti-discrimination agenda in the UK in the 1960s, in a moment described by those who promoted this anti-discrimination agenda as the liberal hour, which referred to the, pol the, the political consensus about the need to fight against discrimination. Next slide, since I have to conclude. Uh, the rebirth or now frame uh, is more clearly linked to nativist readings of the past, which sees the future as the possible restoration of an idolized past at the condition we do something now to stop the catastrophe we created ourselves because we have accepted for too long that minority groups and immigrants challenge our values. I think you can see illustration of this with the Brexit in the UK. You can see that in the debates nowadays about Muslim separatism in France or in how Viktor Orban has framed uh, Hungary as the last battalion that is where uh, the borders and the lifestyle of Hungarian people are in danger. And now to conclude with an open question, it seems that whereas it would make sense that the more history of immigration is mobilized in the present, the more inclusive debates about present immigration are today, that conclusion as a fact is premature. Exclusion is not necessarily linked to a lack of knowledge about the past, it is far more linked to an exclusionary use of the past, irrespective of which narrative of the past is used. A positive narrative of past immigration can still be framed in nativist terms. For example, when we compare the present migrants with the past ones. So it's not simply about being positive about the past or learning lessons from the past. It's also, and even more so, about being very careful that our uses of the past are not driven by an exclusionary vision of today's society. Our understanding of the past is part of the solution only if we understand the present from the perspective of an inclusive and equality-based equality society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christophe Bertassi from France. And now our final speaker is the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsma. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. On September 14, 1925, an exquisite banquet was held at the Royal Palace at Dam Square, the former city hall, on the occasion of the 650th anniversary of Amsterdam. The distinguished guests, which included cabinet ministers and industrialists, delivered speeches extolling the glorious history of the city of Amsterdam. 
The final speaker was Mr. Floor Wiebout, a socialist older man at the zenith of his power. His speech was titled Tomorrow, and I quote, I will not go back 650 years, not 50, not even 20. One shall expect no less of me than to speak about tomorrow. The administration of tomorrow's Amsterdam will be an organ of workers of all kinds. The organ of the working class. The government of Amsterdam shall be focused on the material prosperity and the mental well-being of the big masses of the workers. Tomorrow's meaning of the word prosperity shall be, shall be completely different from the meaning of this word in earlier times. Prosperity will no longer mean the riches of the regent families, not the accumulation of wealth by merchants. Tomorrow, prosperity shall mean the fulfillment of all reasonable needs, material, mental, cultural, for the life of the masses of the workers of the laboring class. End of quote. After Wiebaud's speech had ended, there was an awkward silence among the dignitaries in the room. The words of the socialist older man must have seemed outrageous to the audience present that day. Yet we must not interpret Wiebaud's focus on the future as disregard for the city's then 650 year long past. At the time of, the writing, of writing his speech, Wiebaud also happily supported an enormous historical exhibition that took place as part of the city's anniversary celebrations. And one of the most prestigious exhibits, on loan from the Royal Swed Swedish Academy of Art, was the Rembrandt painting, The Conspiracy of Claudius Civilis. It depicts the eminent Batavian leader Claudius Civilis calling on other chieftains to swear an oath to unite against the Romans. This story of the Batavian revolt is the founding myth that served as inspiration for the 16th century Dutch revolt against the King of Spain. The East India in the company founded Batavia City, now known as Jakarta, the capital of Indo Indonesia. At the end of the 18th century, French-style revolutionaries even named their new state the Batavian Republic. When we take a step back from these dominant narratives steeped in national memory and identity, and regard these events from a viewpoint that is closer to historical reality, we learn that the Batavian leaders were in fact Roman citizens who profited from the Roman Empire, but got caught up in an internal power struggle. They were not freedom fighters, and the very notion of independence was foreign to them. This framing of historical events is nothing out of the ordinary. Historian Ludmila Jordanova tells us, and I quote, The past is everywhere. It is constantly being used and reused, and ideally is not appropriated by special interests. She also writes, the creators of much public history tend to be drawn from small cadres with highly specific agendas, even if they claim to be acting in the name of wider groups. Accordingly, political elites tend to be past masters when it comes to representing and indeed manipulating the past. Following Jordanova, one might easily conclude that political elites should treat history as a concept that should be examined solely in the edifices of academia, by skilled historians who are trained in judging facts and sources and who uphold a professional eth ethical code. 
The historian Margaret Macmillan argues, and I quote, professional historians ought not to surrender their territory so easily. We must do our best to raise the public awareness of the past in all its richness and complexity. If we do not, we allow our leaders and opinion makers to history to bolster false claims and justify bad and foolish policies. I agree with Macmillan that historians should always speak out when people in power abuse history for political gain. However, we should not conclude that governments must leave history entirely to the historians and the museums. This is simply because history is omnipresent. We might pretend to ignore it, but historical ignorance is perhaps just as much an abuse of the past as misrepresentation is. Theologian Walter Brookman wrote, memory produces hope in the same way that amnesia produces despair. So, what way of using history should we strive for? I would argue it is crucial that we approach history as a public phenomena that cannot be claimed by an ideology, group, or individual. Instead, it is necessary to share ownership of the past and work towards a public historical awareness in, much, in which multiple narratives coexist. I will make the case here that we can use the 750th anniversary of the city of Amsterdam to strengthen our local identity in a way that respects the diversity of the city and its history. The founding myth of the Dutch people, the Batavian Revolt, is an example of how history was used for the creation of the Dutch nation-state as an imagined community. And the latter term was, of course, invented by Benedict Anderson in his 1983 work on the history of nationalism. National identity is a product of the imagination, and not in the sense that it is imaginary or unreal, but in the sense that it is constructed from collect collectively preserved memories, stories that have been told again and again, culturally significant, significant symbols and new traditions. It is clear that in an age of globalization, individualization and increased migration, national identities struggle to inspire such a sense of belonging, loyalty and solidarity, especially because national identity is too often framed as a fixed cultural identity, or worse even, as an ethnic identity. And I think it is time to move beyond the perception of an imagined community as a national phenomenon. It is thus no coincidence that in this city, young people, especially those who have roots in other countries, tend to identi identify themselves as Amsterdammers, Amsterdammers rather than as Dutch citizens. So we must build on this local identity to make sure it can complement national Dutch citizenship. A local identity leaves room for people to simultaneously adopt many other collective and individual identities. We all strive towards having a common identity that inspires us to find common ground and feel like we belong in the city we live in. But all group identities must serve the needs of any individual that combines 
countless identities, as the Dutch anthropologist Sinan Chankaya illustrated. And we can also adopt the ideal of the shared identity that serves everyone, <coughs> I'm sorry, that serves everyone in the way we present our history. The 750th anniversary of the city of Amsterdam is an occasion to strengthen a local identity that helps us to navigate towards the future together. To my knowledge, 1875 was the first time that the anniversary of the city was celebrated. The date was based on the old, oldest known document to mention Amsterdam, which dates from 1275 and names the people who live nearby the Amstel Dam. A group of prominent citizens organized a large-scale exhibition that received a wide audience. Fifty years later, in 1925, the moment Wiebaud spoke, the occasion was marked by an even bigger and more professionally organized exhibition. The last time Amsterdam celebrated its anniversary was in 1975. It was a year-long celebration full of festivities and cultural events. Community facilities were repaired, playgrounds were given a fresh coat of paint. A huge gathering of historical tall ships, the first edition of Sail Amsterdam, reminded visitors of the city's awe-inspiring maritime history. And to top it all off, the city's historical center and its iconic canals were recreated in a miniature version at the Rai Exhibition Center. But as parents were taking their children to see Amsterdam in miniature, the city's government was planning to demolish large parts of the very same historical center that was on display a mere four kilometers away. The plans included destroying one of the oldest parts of the city, part of the new marked area, to construct an underground metro and a four-lane motorway cutting right through the heart of the city. Residents of the area, squatters and heritage protection activists took to the streets in protest. As we now know, these protests unfortunately turned into violent clashes with the police. But they also resulted in a re-evaluation of the city's historical center. Much of the new marked area was saved from destruction and the city of Amsterdam adopted new plans for urban moder modernization which would allow for preserving its historical and architectural heritage. But meanwhile, across the city, at the other end of the planned metro line, new Amsterdammers from Suriname, the Dutch colony that would become an independent nation that same year organized a small football tournament. Over the years, this event would grow into the Kwaku Festival, a culinary and cultural celebration of the many histories, identities and cultures that make up Amsterdam. And today it has become one of the most widely loved festivals in our city. The organizers of the football tournament lived far away from the city center and its historic canal district. But Afro-Caribbean and other immigrant communities, first Jewish, later Chinese and many other alongside them, had always been part of the history of the Neumarkt area. They too. Research by our own uh, city Archives has illustrated the presence of an Afro-Atlantic community there that dates back to the 17th century 
Even earlier than that, Amsterdam's first Jewish communities arrived in 1610, and almost 300 years later, Chinese immigrants made Amsterdam their home. But in 1975, the history of these groups was hardly celebrated and also not depicted anywhere in the museums or at the family event in the Rai Exhibition Center. Nor were, there, were the stories of the workers at the ship wharves in the north of the city in a constant struggle with poverty, or the laborers in other parts of town, such as Floradorp, Jordaan, or the Pipe, trying to escape their impoverished neighborhoods, or the guest workers from southern Europe, Turkey, Morocco. Amsterdam has always been a city of social movements, both big and small. In past years, we have seen student protesters occupy university buildings, members of Extinction Rebellion, farmers, Black Lives Matter activists, and anti-lockdown protesters take to the city streets. Local youth ignore social distancing rules to come together in the parks. These are all very different groups, movements and protests. But they all have helped me understand how so often it has been the actions of ordinary people that have determined the history of our city. At the end of the 19th century, the workers in the Jordaan staged a quite sudden and aggressive revolt which completely took political elites and officials by surprise. Not long after that, new legislation was introduced that would improve the condition of the workers. And here's another example. Have we ever even considered how different our city would be without the women's movement? These movements changed our city for the better. The sociologist Saskia Sassen has written, cities are the spaces where those without power get to make a history and a culture. This must be represented in our city's history. These stories of how individual struggles, the histories of those countless identities, have created a city that is in constant flux, constant renewal. The 750th anniversary of Amsterdam provides us with an opportunity to present a refreshed historiography of the city, in which a multipl multiplicity of histories from all groups and communities in the cities are represented. And with intent, I borrow the word refreshed from the latest exhibition of the Amsterdam Museum, which is already providing an example of how to do this. On the topic of black history, we have seen a fruitful exchange between activists, historians, museums and the government. Jennifer Tosh, Tosh who just spoke has been one of the early activists and educators. In recent years, the black archives have proven to be a genuine citizen's historians. They have changed the way other museums and, lo and the local government present history. Now we are not only working towards more, more acknowledgement of the history of slavery, but also the recognition of unjustly forgotten icons of the anti-colonialism and anti-racism movements. I would like to invite historians, activists, artists and all others who are interested to join us in presenting the history of the unseen people who throughout history have pushed the city forward to unknown futures. If we recall the past and write history in the right way, we can see that the essence of history 
is just that, change. Rebecca Solnit writes, things don't always change for the better, but they change. And we can play a role in that change if we act, which is where hope comes in, and memory, the collective memory we call history. Almost 100 years ago, Floor Wiebaud condemned the practice of using history as a source of pride for the powerful few. But to paraphrase him, tomorrow it can be a source of hope for everybody. Thank you. Many thanks to the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema. Now we will have a 15-minute uh, discussion with Jennifer Tosh and Christophe Bertussi. Unfortunately, the mayor has other very important um, 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 stuff to do, we can imagine. So, but thank you so much. Um, can I invite Jennifer to join me here? Thank you so much for coming. Good to be here. And for your wonderful talk Great and program. presentation. Thank you. And we'll see um, uh, Christoph uh, online uh, via Zoom. Yeah, you can just watch there. I'll, or, yeah, I'll. Hello, everyone. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Philippe. Christoph, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, it's really um, an honor to, to have all of, you, all of you three here to discuss this uh, with us. Okay, well, Corona proof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much again for your presentation. Wonderful. What a wonderful city we have, right? Yeah, I actually love Amsterdam and the Netherlands. I've been here now for almost nine years and I've definitely fallen in love with uh, being here. Sometimes it may not be obvious because of uh, the, the I, I am critical also, but I'm critical because I, I do belong and I claim that very strongly. Yeah, that's great because indeed I got a little bit afraid if I can be self congratulatory, <laughs> congratulatory yeah. on uh, living in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. But indeed, I also feel a sense of pride Absolutely. that we are having these talks and that we can discuss this so openly Absolutely. today. Absolutely. So, well, some um, uh, comments and questions are coming Ooh, in uh, via the Q&A. And um, so I, I have here my iPad to, 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 to look into them. And, well, one of the main things that, that come to the fore, and I would really like to, to hear your thoughts about this, is history, the historical stories that, that we learn or that we start to identify, have learned to identify with, are so very important to people. How can we expect from people to change their perspective or to, to embrace these other stories or edit the, these refreshed histories? If it is so important for your own identity to know where your roots are and where you're coming from and how this this yeah, th th this process has has gone about. Would you like to start, uh, Jennifer? I, I think this is a great question, and one of the things I um, remind myself, and I also uh, share with other people, is it's that in terms of the way that I approach um, uh, these these uh, narratives, is not trying to replace one with the other, or to you know every nation state has a glory story. I mean, I, I was born in the United States, you know, my family's from Suriname in the Netherlands and, and also um, connected very much to the continent of Africa. And every nation has their glory story. I mean, that's, that's part of what nationalism produces is that you, you build a sense of pride and you want, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But has been the problem, why it's been problematized is that that, that has become the, the single story as, as I said, and what people have rejected other people's identities in uh, in place of this notion of a fixed 
uh, nationalism. And that's where the problem arises, where there is no room for other voices to uh, emerge. And it's not about competing uh, histories or narratives. It's about they coexist. They're intertwined. They're interwoven. So you can't talk about one a glory story and demonize another uh, in place of that. So I think that's that's really what I was hoping that came across is that just to allow that this is this is natural and organic and it should be part of uh, our national identity and not exclusionary as as it was also uh, defined. I think it's in, indeed comparable to the process that many of our fellows go through at Absolutely. NIAS and students uh, in, in, during their education, that learning is always a kind of painful process to accept that the world was not only uh, uh, what you thought it was, but to really open up. And uh, so that, that will be your call, I believe. Absolutely. And that means also that we have to unlearn. <laughs> some things, right? Um, things that I grew up hearing as stories, I also have had to deconstruct them because they were sometimes rooted in nostalgia and fantasy, but yet they they formed my identity as this, you know, mixed uh, cultural uh, person, you know, American girl growing up in the U.S. with Surinamese uh, heritage. I mean, I didn't really get a sense of pride of that until I came to the Netherlands. Yeah. Christophe, may I ask you, how, how do you feel, can we, can we expect from people if their identity is so much intertwined with a, a, a certain version or version, a, one side of history, can we expect from people to learn to open up? I think it's not only up to uh, individual people, but it's also about the context and, and social and political context and historical context. Today is a historical context for the, that will be studied in the future. These contexts are shifting and they, are, they create many constraints in our ability to be critical in the way Jennifer invites us to be. So uh, my, my answer would be that uh, in order to, 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 to learn and, and unlearn in order to live together, we have to engage in the retelling together our story, which is an ongoing process, which never stops. So it's, it's a constant deliberation that involves all of us um, and uh, uh, making it the more inclusive, I would say, is a constant effort. Uh, it's an effort from all sides of the society, but since there is so much of a political dimension in our discussion about memory and history and how we deal and confront the problematic past of Western uh, societies, as we, we've been focusing our, our, our discussion today rather on Western uh, societies, uh, it makes it it's even more demanding uh, because the past is a battlefield for the present. The, 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 the today's situation, I would say, calls for at the same time uh, to do that work of creating an even more inclusive perception of our collective past, which is related to who we are as a, a, a complex. Uh, 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 society living together with all these layers of history, but it's also a matter of the status of the liberal democracy in the present time. And therefore, I, I, I would connect uh, my, my, my answer to your question to some worries about the most recent political uh, transformations that have occurred within the European context the context of the European Union, as well as in the US uh, over, over the last, let's say, two decades. And we have seen how there were political forces trying to stop that dialectic of the retelling our story together. And, 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 and this is... Uh, this is a, a, a cause for great concern. I think it, it, it should be part also of our discussion today. 
Yes, yeah, so another thing that pops up in the Q&A and also in my mind is the whole idea and also what the mayor said about that she believes that, that politicians um, should be engaged in a way with history. But if we talk about the combination or the relation between politics and history, and, and, and uh, the three of you and also Jan Willem Duivendak were talking about the, the use and misuse or abuse of history in the present. That could also sound a little bit like a kind of conspiracy theory, right? Like there's a complot of people trying to, to, to put certain historical facts into the history books and, and leaving out others just to position themselves or to keep their dominant position. How do you think it's, it's helpful to politicize history in that sense? I, I, I don't think that politicizing, if I may answer to the point, because it's uh, it, it's directly connected to to, to my my, uh, my my first answer. Politicizing further uh, history and memory is not the solution, but we have to face a situation where both are already politicized. So we we would uh, like to live in a better world, but the, 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 the facts is that uh, they are both uh, politicized. History and memory are all about a, a matter of choice, right? We decide, some people decide whether we include some part of our past and whether we should exclude some other part of our past. And uh, Jennifer in our talk uh, quoted Pierre Nora, who is a very important French historian who invented this notion of the place of memory, lieu de mémoire. And I, I thought it was at the same time very uh, important to use this notion of place of memory in our discussion because it's, it, it's all about the mobilization of some places of memory to push towards a more inclusive uh, awareness about, about our past. But Pierre Nora today in the discussion about the French past and French history just uh, 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 got engaged in a discussion about whether we should celebrate uh, Napoleon or the French Commune, because we we this year is the anniversary of 200 years of the death of of Napoleon and 150 years of uh, the Le Commune. And Pierre Nora said and and jumped into the discussion. He said we should choose Napoleon over La Commune. So a professional historian of this importance is engaging in a discussion, which is a matter of politics, saying it's Napoleon over the commune. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Yeah, I, I, would agree, I would echo that in the sense that history is political. If you think about the history of politics itself, it's very selective, right? It's, uh, politicians use um, fragments or pieces of history to suit their own agendas. I mean, that's... That's a, that's not new. Um, I, I keep uh, going back to uh, a statement, for example, that the prime minister made about returning to the VOC mentality, which was a really strong misuse of, of, of historical, but yet very much rooted in this idea of the dominant narrative and, and that, that nostalgia and, you know, longing for for this imagined uh, past that, uh, that I think that uh, Mayor Hasma spoke about also very beautifully. Um, and I don't know that we can stop that train from happening. I mean, that's part of the, the, the beast of politics. But I think where, where I see the movement shift or this, this idea of the shift happening is that more groups, and, I, and, and I, we also have to start to interrogate language a lot more in this conversation because these terms that we've used for so long, the idea of the West you know, I remember growing up thinking uh, when I was learning in school about the Middle East, I always used to ask, well, where is that? The middle of what? East of what? Who created the Middle East? You know, so we, we really have to start to be more aware of, of the terms and language that we use and how that also reinforces this notion of, of the politics of history. Yeah. So we're all guilty of this. And this is why I think we talk about why it's so important to unlearn and to really think about these uh, categories carefully. Very clear, and thank you so much. Um, 
Unfortunately, we have to wrap up because no. uh, time flies when you're having such great discussions. Just one or two sentences on your main takeaway from today. Christophe, what is your main takeaway from this, this lecture? It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to answer your, your <laughs> question, of course. It's very intimidating. But I'd say <laughs> at the same time, a call uh, for hope in the future but also uh, a, a call for extreme vigilance in the way uh, history is used and, and abused because uh, we are going through difficult time and history is part of the solution, but our conception of the present is also part of the solution and we should find positive ways to, to, to go forward towards a more inclusive society. Thank you so much, Christophe, and also for being with us today. Jennifer, your final words. Oh, yes, I agree with Christophe. It's hard to put that in a few words, but I think th two things that really, um, for me, th that resonated for today about today is that we were all had a, the future in mind, right? The f I, I talk about, not to be cliche, but the future, what is the future for the past? And that I think we're all negotiating that every day in the work that we do. I am so deeply honored to be uh, at the center of this movement uh, with many of my friends and colleagues who are, are watching us today who have influenced my thinking and my also my work in, in ways I can't even count. And I think the other takeaway is that we all asked in our own way the question, what are we willing to do? What are we willing to give to give up uh, the structures of knowing, of knowledge that we sometimes hold on to for fear of loss of the sense of self. Um, I think that is an open question that I ta have taken away from today and all the possibilities that have been presented. There's no excuses. That's what I'm left with. There are no excuses. Yeah. Everyone can do something. And I think that's, um, that's an important takeaway. Thank you so much, Jennifer, also for your participation today. Well, I think my main takeaway is something Christophe also said in his talk, that exclusion is not solved with creating a more inclusive history. That is, that is something that really struck me, uh, that there is a lot of work still to do, but let's start with creating a more inclusive history starting today. And thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Femke Halsema, if you're still watching. And I would like to thank you all at home for joining us today. I would like to thank Pakhuis de Zwijger. I would like very much to uh, thank Maxion Events uh, for the great organization of this event and all the other people who have helped uh, to create this event today. Jan Willem Duiverdak for your speech and... Um, yes. And sites of memory, the, the uh, Richard Coffee and the Amsterdam Museum, of course. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, you have registered for this annual NIAS lecture, so that, so that might mean that you are interested to keep um, yourself posted on our future events. In June, we will have a conference, a three-day conference on belonging. Please make sure you sign up. We have some wonderful speakers there uh, and many panels, so be involved. And you will receive a digital memory box of this day with uh, some of the lectures and uh, all nice uh, gadgets. So please um, keep engaged, keep involved and keep the collective learning going. Thank you all so much and see you another time.